Friends, please join us in singing this next song that was especially requested by our speaker tonight, Amazing Grace. Can you hear me now? There it is. Good evening, friends. 
My name is Tracy Jelt Sullivan. Uh, I serve on the FGC staff as the Associate Secretary for Development. I am a friend because I have experienced the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. And I believe that that power is more accessible to me within the community and the discipline of friends. I work for FGC because I believe in the transformational potential of the Quaker path. Yesterday, I thought I would be standing here telling you about all the ways FGC serves friends fr throughout the year. However, last night, Philandro Castile was killed in his car outside Minneapolis after being stopped by police for a broken taillight. Tonight is not the night to tell you more about FGC. The transformational potential of Quaker faith and practice is offered to us, but it is not guaranteed. Without faithful action, transformation is impossible. Today, as one friend to another, I ask myself and I ask you to be faithful to the nudge for change and action that God has already sown in our hearts. Except in worship just now, it occurred to me that as a white friend, when I look around at other white friends, I suspect it is not a nudge. I suspect that it is the insistent siren for change and we have to take out our earplugs. We must trust that as we humbly step forward to make the changes that are world and our God demands of us, that we must trust in unfolding guidance, that it will continue to be available to us. Just as George Fox walked into the bog, seeing one step at a time, he did not need to see the end of the path to know that it was important to step forward. First of all, I was given the advice if friends could move towards the center so that we can allow seats on the aisle available to those who are probably still making their way here. And if we could do this in a worshipful manner, so much the better. Secondly, and before I forget, I know that there are parents who will need to pick up children or go to other responsibilities at 845. If it's around that hour and we are still wrapping up, if you could do your best to leave when I am returning to the microphone and interrupt me, that would be so much the better, but I realize it may not be perfect for everyone who needs to be somewhere else. My name is Liz Oppenheimer. <clears throat> 
I worship with Laughing Waters Friends Preparative Meeting, part of Iowa Yearly Meeting Conservative. I want to give you a few logistics about tonight. Our speaker, Dr. Nikima Levy Pounds, will end her remarks around 8.30 and take a few questions from the audience and we will have microphone runners. And her remarks in the Q&A, God willing, will end around 8.45. Applause at the end of her remarks, as well as at the end of the Q&A, are entirely appropriate for tonight. After the plenary, there will be two brief sessions that friends, there will actually be three opportunities that friends may attend beginning at 9 p.m. There will be opportunities to gather in small groups for action planning given the incidents of the week. And I'll be sharing details about this later. Worship sharing will be in the recital hall in this building. And the facilitators for that are Gail Llewellyn and Paul Buckley. There will also be, again, God willing, a short conversation in a smaller environment with Dr. Levy Pounds in the family theater. And if all has gone well, a trail of blue tape on the floor outside of this auditorium should lead you to that room. And I will be giving you reminders about this, about these details, these three opportunities following their speaker. Also, perhaps with a break from traditional Quaker convention, Dr. Levy Pounds encourages us to live tweet tonight. Her Twitter handle is at N, as in nature, V, as in victory, Levy, L-E-V-Y. Please use the hashtags FGC16 and FGC Nakima. So that's FGC N, as in nature, E-K-I-M, as in majesty, A. FGC Nakima. If you don't understand any of that, let it go. Black Lives Matter. God can't breathe. When I read a name, please reply with God can't breathe. Michael Brown. Von Derrett Myers, Sandra Bland, Eric Garner, Ricky Boyd, Trayvon Martin, and just this week, while we have been here, Alton Sterling and Jerry Williams. And just last night, 90 minutes southeast of here, Philando Castile. That's eight months after Jamar Clark was shot and killed in Minneapolis.
Jamar Clark. For white people and European Americans, white fragility and socialization into whiteness teaches those of us who believe we are white to sink into despair, to go numb, to fret over these death by cop shootings. God help transform our numbness into awakeness and bold action. Help transform our white fragility into racial stamina. As one organizer told me a few years ago, when the legislative year in Minnesota looked bleak at the time, this is not the time to wring our hands. This is a time to get to work. As a person of faith, Dr. Nakima Levy Pounds is someone who has gotten to work. She traveled to Ferguson as a legal observer in 2015 and was tear gassed. She protested the police killing of Jamar Clark and was arrested at the Mall of America with trumped up charges two days before Christmas. When the local groups Black Liberation Project and Black Lives Matter Minneapolis and Black Clergy United for Change occupied the Minneapolis Police's fourth precinct for 18 days, she was there and leveraged her privilege as a respected community member of color. And she helped shut down a major freeway and risked arrest and was arrested. I urge you tonight to simply notice your thoughts, feelings, body sensations, and visions as you listen to the bold message that the Spirit brings us tonight through Dr. Levy Pounds. Good evening. You guys got it. That's what I'm used to in the black church, call and response. It's truly a privilege and an honor to be here tonight. I'm so glad and thankful and blessed that I was able to make it. I had no idea what would happen over the last 24 hours after finding out about the shooting death of Philando Castile at the hands of the St. Anthony Police Department um, right outside of St. Paul. Um, St. Anthony uh, Police Department is actually located in Minneapolis. Most of us didn't even know that St. Anthony had its own police department until last night when we saw the chilling video um, on Facebook. And so the, for I have, have only had 30 minutes of sleep in the last 24 hours. So I, um, I know something about bold action <laughs> based, based on, on that experience, camping out in front of the governor's mansion. And people are probably still out there. So I want to take you on a journey with me tonight. I like storytelling. I think that we learn best when we hear about others' experiences when we hear about other people's awakening and the ways in which God has worked in the life of a person or persons to move them from complacency towards bold action. So um, I wanna thank Liz for that wonderful introduction. 
I've come to know Liz uh, through her activism, standing on the front lines in Minneapolis, being a part of Black Lives Matter, being at a number of demonstrations. Uh, most recently, we were standing outside of the FBI building together, wearing t-shirts that said, slavery never ended in America, and um, raising questions and concerns about the decisions that were made to not charge the two officers who killed Jamar Clark. So Liz alluded to Jamar Clark, but I'll talk in more in detail about him um, as the story unfolds. So in terms of my background, um, I was born in Jackson, Mississippi in 1976, which was about eight years after Dr. King was assassinated. It's important for me to give that context because so often in school, when we learn about the civil rights movement, we learn about Rosa Parks refusing to give up her seat. We learn about Dr. King being a great civil rights leader who had a dream, which we all know. And we learned about people who protested and demonstrated. And we know that some laws changed, some policies changed, the Jim Crow system came to an end, and things are so much better now. Well, that was my belief system for a very long time. I would argue that many of us have been indoctrinated um, into a white supremacist ideology. But most of the time we're unaware of it because those messages about white people being superior hit us hard every single day. Whether we're reading the newspaper, whether we're watching the news, whether we're reading textbooks in school, whether we're reading magazines, watching movies, having conversations with friends, being on social media, the ideology of white supremacy continues to creep in. And before you know it, your perception of yourself has changed, your perception of the people around you has changed, and then we began to act upon what we learned. And it is very difficult for people to unlearn a white supremacist ideology unless they're willing to do so. It's not going to happen through osmosis. It's not going to happen by happenstance. It takes intentional effort and action for that to happen. So I applaud you all for focusing on bold action and being willing to be challenged tonight. And I can say that because I've been challenged in my own faith. After having learned a lot of the lies that many of us have learned about what happened during the civil rights movement and its aftermath and how wonderful the country is for everyone, as I said before, I went on a journey with God and it completely changed my life. But growing up uh, as a child in Jackson, Mississippi, eight years after Dr. King was assassinated, uh, I remember in my community of Mississippi, mostly uh, poor black uh, neighborhood is what I lived in. Um, the reality though is that even though we were poor economically, it was a very rich and vibrant community. So people had um, different trades and skills and talents. Sometimes they would barter with each other Another value um, of the community was looking out for the children of the community. So if I got into trouble, I could not only uh, face punishment from my own parents, but my neighbors might act as my parents and punish me as well. And then they would make sure that they let my parents know, you know, whatever I did. So, so you could potentially expect to be punished twice. It was just the system that we grew up in, but it was a system of love and accountability. And it helped to shape my value system as a person. But I watched my family struggle. Most of the people in my family worked. My granddad did construction. My grandmother was a cafeteria lady. A lot of times they had odd jobs, but the reality is that they were still poor. And part of that had to do with the fact that although there were quite a number of gains during the Civil Rights Movement with the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act being passed, the Jim Crow system coming to a screeching halt after roughly 13 years of protest, there was not a major shift in the division of wealth in this country. So think about a lot of the black folks who lived in Mississippi. Many of them were descendants of slaves. <laughs> 
Now, we weren't necessarily taught that when we were younger, primarily because black people in the South really didn't share a lot of inf family information. Part of that had to do with the terrorism that black people endured. And they knew that saying the wrong thing to the wrong person could cause someone to be lynched or run out of town or any other egregious acts to happen to them. And so a lot of things were on the hush-hush. So growing up, I had no idea that I was a descendant of slaves. I just knew I, I lived in a poor household. School never explained that to me. My family never talked about those things. It took me a long time to begin to understand the cultural context in which I was living as a black child in the Deep South in the aftermath of the Civil Rights Movement. So think about the people of Mississippi whose ancestors had toiled night and day, often for free, um, who experienced brutality at the hands of their masters, told when to get up, when to go to bed, when to prepare meals, which religions they could practice, um, who they were forced to breed with, experiencing rape, and other forms of sexual assault and sexual abuse. And that's just a small fraction of what they endured. So imagine being a part of that system as an ancestor and knowing that once slavery ended, you were promised at a minimum 40 acres and a mule, which was really just a, a drop in the bucket, a very minor token of all of the labor that people had put forward and then even having that 40 acres and a mule withdrawn, the promise snatched away. Now, what does that mean? As a slave, you're uneducated because it was a crime to teach slaves how to read. As a matter of fact, those who tried to teach slaves how to read were in risk, uh, at risk of uh, being maimed or slain in some manner. So you're deprived of education. You're deprived of economic opportunity. You're deprived of the ability to run your own life and take care of your own family from one generation to the next. And then you are unleashed upon American society and forced to fiend for yourself against people whose ancestors were not in that situation, whose ancestors were able to own land whose ancestors were able to secure jobs and sometimes run their own businesses and sometimes purchase homes, which we know is wealth that's transferred from one generation to the next, who were allowed to gain access to a quality education. So that is who my ancestors were competing against. Now, there's no way for the descendants of those people to catch up in society especially if you don't do anything affirmatively to address the hundreds of years of a head start of those who were not subjected to the institution of slavery, the brutal, egregious, horrific institution of slavery. And so as the descendants of those people, you are bearing a lot of the same burdens from one generation after the next. And all the while, as you're living on the margins of society, facing exclusion, continuing to be denied access to economic opportunity, being treated as less than human in the aftermath of slavery, you're told, guess what? Try to achieve the American dream. You can do it, just work hard. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps, even if you never had boots in the first place. We have to begin to understand that that is the bedrock of white supremacy ideology in America. And it's one that most of us have internalized, this false notion of achievement, whereby simply working hard and applying ourselves, we have been able to rise to the top. Well, I would argue that that is a false notion. And that's the first lie that we have to begin to deconstruct. Now, I can say that as someone who did work hard, but I didn't get to this place by myself. I had people 
who recognizes the circumstance that my family was in and who did something important for me. Number one, they believed in me, but even more importantly, they extended something called social, cultural, and intellectual capital to me so that I would understand how to navigate mainstream society, both the written rules and the unwritten rules. And there are a number of unwritten rules in society. And what we have to understand is that knowledge is power. If you don't know what you don't know, then how can you apply that information to your life, to your, your, your daily habits and practices in order to get ahead? So there's stored up knowledge and stored up wealth. And there are institutions that have denied people of color access from one generation to the next. And so when we look at communities like the one that I grew up in in Mississippi, it's easy to say, oh, the people are just lazy. Or they didn't work hard, or they don't care about education, or they keep having all these children, and that's why they're poor. Ignoring the history that they were forced to endure. The fact that reconciliation never occurred. The fact that they never uh, received a true apology. No one's heart was really broken at the thought of the institution of slavery, maybe other than the abolitionists, which I know Quakers were a part of that particular movement, and those who were enslaved. But the rest of society kept on with business as usual. And see, that's how things perpetuate, by continuing to do what you have always done. If we don't stop and do something different, things will continue on as they have always been. That's why disruption is so necessary. And Rosa Parks understood that on December 1st of 1955 when she refused to give up her seat. What she told people is that I wasn't just tired like people said. Yes, I worked hard, but that wasn't the reason that I refused to give up my seat to a white man. First of all, I wasn't even sitting in the white section of the bus. I was sitting in the first row that was reserved for black people. Because all of the seats for white people were filled, a white man approached Rosa Parks and demanded that she give up her seat, but she said, no. And her act of courage and heroism rang the death knell in the Jim Crow system. Part of the reason why that happened is that Rosa Parks was willing to accept the consequences for her involvement in civil disobedience. She has a mugshot to show for her act of heroism. And we know that it was a major catalyst for change in America and across the world. Now, one of the things that Rosa Parks said was, I wasn't just tired, as I said before. She said, all I could think about was Emmett Till. Emmett Till. For those who don't know, I mean, we've, we've started in this movement bringing up Emmett Till's name again. As a matter of fact, some of his relatives actually live here in the state of Minnesota, and they can recount the day that Emmett Till was snatched out of bed in Money, Mississippi, just like it was yesterday. They're still traumatized as a result of what happened to their relative. For those who don't know about Emmett Till, Emmett Till was a 14-year-old boy who lived in Chicago with his mother, Mamie Till. Mamie Till had moved from Mississippi seeking a better life, traveled to Chicago, which was not unusual for African-Americans seeking economic opportunity. But after she moved to Chicago and got established, Emmett wanted to visit the relatives in Mississippi, so she allowed him to do so. Well, one day during Emmett's visit, he walked into a store which was owned by white people, again, which was not unusual. And as he was walking out of the store, he said, bye, baby, or, I, or, or whistled at the white woman behind the counter. So there are a couple of versions of what he did that day. And when he walked out of the store, his relatives and friends said, you were in trouble for doing that, you can get killed. And he said, no, I have white friends back in Chicago, it's not a big deal. So they didn't tell any adults about this. And so a few days later, the husband and the brother of the woman who was behind the store counter that day, 
came to Emmett Till's uncle's house in the middle of the night, dragged him out of bed, took him to a barn or some other deserted place, and beat and tortured and beat and tortured and beat and tortured Emmett Till until he was unrecognizable. In addition to beating him in such a horrific manner, they actually shot him as well and, and continued to torture him. And ultimately, they threw his body in the Tallahatchie River. When they found his body and they pulled him up, the only way that his mother was able to recognize him was a ring that he was wearing that belonged to his father. Outside of that, there was no other way to recognize him. And if anyone wants to see a picture, you can Google Emmett Till if you can stomach what his face looked like and you can see those pictures. One of the interesting things that happened during that period of time in Money, Mississippi, which, you know, he was killed on August 28th of 1955. One of the interesting things was that his mother, Mamie Till, demanded an open casket funeral. The reason that she demanded an, an, an open casket funeral is because she said, my son's face represents the, the ugliness of racial hatred in America. Now prior to what happened to Emmett Till, he was beautiful. He looked angelic even. But after what they did to him, his face looked like something you would see in the worst kind of horror movie or nightmare. But she forced America to look at the mirror of itself. America, land of the free, home of the brave, to look at itself and the ugliness that had been hidden beneath the surface, masked by the prosperity within this country, primarily of the white majority. But her forcing that casket to be open became a day of reconciliation and recognition of the truth of what happens when you peel back the layers and you look at the ugliness of racism for what it is. And I would argue that the ugliness of racism is still in America today. Most of us have been taught to ignore it. We've been taught to be consumed by everything happening in our daily lives, all of the distractions. And yes, we know that many of us have to work a nine to five to provide for our families. But that should not come at the expense of harm being done to our fellow man, woman, and child. And we look the other way. Because perhaps it's not happening to anyone in our family or anyone that we know personally. And it's easy to tune out injustice. It's easy to tune out poverty. It's easy to tune out issues of mass incarceration and the impacts of the war on drugs. And I would argue that's exactly what our society has done, even within our faith communities. Rarely in many of our faith institutions do we even talk about social justice. I think that that is not only sad, but it causes me to reflect upon what faith really is. Is it just showing up on a particular day and worshiping and singing the right songs and rubbing elbows with the right people and singing to a God that you claim to serve? Or is it something deeper? Does it actually require putting our faith in action? And I would argue that most of us refuse to go that far. It's not that we can't go that far. We refuse to go that far. Why? Because it is going to result in some level of discomfort to how we live our lives. And many of us talk a good game, but we don't want to get uncomfortable. We don't want to challenge our own privilege. We don't want an open casket of the ugliness of racism in our own hearts. Because rarely are we challenged to hold that mirror up to ourselves. We hold our mirror, our, our, ourselves up to a mirror of society that tells us that we're all right. As long as you're making above a certain income, you have a certain education level, you live in a nice neighborhood, particularly in the suburbs, you drive a decent car, you can send your kids to college, you're doing all right. I would argue that that is a false 
notion of God's version of what it means to be doing all right. It's a false notion. I do not believe that God is pleased with the fact that many of us have so assimilated into mainstream culture that it is difficult to differentiate a person who is practicing their faith and one who is completely secular or agnostic. I would argue that something is wrong with that picture. Not necessarily being agnostic on his face, but the fact that we claim to serve a God and there is no evidence other than being religious to prove that. I began to grapple with these issues in my childhood. One, as I watched the struggle of my community in Jackson, Mississippi, but then when I was eight and a half years old, we moved from Jackson, Mississippi to South Central Los Angeles. Now that was like moving into a whole other world. I thought we were poor in Jackson, Mississippi, but when I moved to South Central Los Angeles, there was a whole other type of poverty. As soon as we drove into the community, I saw graffiti on the walls. I saw people standing on the corners. I saw people in gangs. I saw a heavy police presence. I saw dilapidated buildings in some parts of the community. And it looked and felt like a land of desolation. And I couldn't quite understand how this could be happening in Los Angeles, California where we constantly hear of how beautiful it is. It's a place where people want to go and experience the good life. Well, when you are poor in South Central Los Angeles, most of the time you experience anything but the good life. In my community, which was comprised of mostly African Americans and Latinos, most of the people lived at or well below the poverty lines. Many people worked part-time jobs but relied upon public assistance to supplement their resources. Sometimes lived in subsidized housing or had um, Section 8, which is a federal housing program, to help families in need be able to afford standard rent of, a, um, of an apartment or a home. So most of those families were in dire straits. And facing economic injustice coupled with being locked out of mainstream institutions cause hopelessness to set in. See, I don't think we often think about the true value of institutions. And that's because for many of us, we have open access. What do we have to think about? Somebody opened the door, somebody gave us a tip, or we were born into something that we could just walk into. So why would we think about its value? When you are poor and you don't have access, that means that you are not going to connect with people who maybe have a different socioeconomic lens, who can maybe share knowledge, who can maybe share information, who could share contacts, who could use their networks to open doors for you. You don't have access to that. See, so think about country clubs and the purpose they serve. They're not just for leisure and recreational activities. How many people go to country clubs to actually do business deals? sitting down, smoking cigars, drinking whatever they're doing, playing golf, a lot of times they're setting the stage for multi-million dollar business deals that the average person is not privy to. Now that's a more extreme example for many of us in this room, but think about our social institutions, especially when we attend churches where everybody is white. Maybe there's a token African American or two thrown in, or another person of color, sometimes we have people who have migrated here, thrown in, but the institution itself is still white. It's still white in how it lives out its faith, its practices, its policies. And oftentimes in those white institutions, and I'm not just talking about physically having white bodies present, I'm talking about the ideology of white supremacy being present. To the point where as a person of color, being invited to the table is really feeling more like being a token at the table. Because when you're sitting at the table and everyone is thinking the same way, based on the same set of experiences, where they haven't necessarily been challenged about who they are, why they think the way that they think, 
it's going to be difficult to offer a different perspective and have that perspective be valued. You're often seen as the outlier in that situation or the troublemaker. And you can imagine, I've been called a troublemaker before. There's no shame in my game at this point. And part of that has to do with the fact that when I'm invited to sit at these white power tables, the first thing I say is, are you sure you want me at the table? Because I refuse to be a token at the table. If I see something that does not make sense or excludes the voices and perspectives of people of color, I am going to say something. I am going to challenge that thinking. I'm going to challenge that way of doing business, and I'm going to keep on challenging it until something breaks open, until some form of change begins to happen. And so I make sure that they really want me, that they don't just want a black smiling face nodding their head, and they have to make a decision. That puts the burden back on them to say, what do you really want when you invite a person of color to the table? Do you want the truth or do you want an, an anemic version of the truth? And many institutions just want an anemic version. I said, then go find somebody else because I'm not the right one. I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to waste my energy. I don't want to waste my intellectual capital on people who are not interested in hearing a different worldview. Why? Because they've never been forced to. <clears throat> and where every institution that they enter tells them that they are the best at everything. How can one race be the best at everything? <laughs> Seriously. How can one race be the smartest, the most business savvy, the most social, the greatest inventors and creators and things like that? It is not possible. God is a God of diversity. That's what we have to understand. We're made in God's image, but God is a God of diversity. That's why you have different hair colors in the room, different eye colors, different skin tones, different complexions, people who are good at math and some who aren't. That's why I went to law school, because I wasn't. <laughs> but the reality is that God knows what God is doing when God made us all different. We have to understand that society is the enemy of difference. Society tells us to conform in just about every way. That's why you go to some suburban communities, every house on the block looks exactly the same. And people are proud to live there. They're all rolling out their trash cans on Monday night, smiling and waving at each other, walking their dogs, smiling, just living the dream, sitting on a patio and deck, you know, drinking wine, looking at their neighbors. Hey, Sue, you're out here again. Some of y'all laughing because you know that, you know, that's the life you live. I'm not judging you. I'm just saying. So society tells us to all be the same. And as a matter of fact, when you think about this notion of whiteness, one of the things that's really interesting about it is that folks that we call white people Okay, which is the majority of, of individuals in this room, really do have some type of an ethnic background. Okay, whether, whether your family was Scottish or German or Irish, you know, the list goes on and on of which ethnicity your bloodline and heritage may be connected to. But American society tells white people, throw that ethnic identity out the window. Throw those cultural norms out the window. Throw those family traditions out the window. Throw those different languages and accents out the window and put on a cloak of whiteness. And with that cloak of whiteness, you're just like everybody else. Why? Because whiteness is a form of power. But most of the time, you're not taught to recognize the power. It, it's so natural and normal as a day-to-day -day part of who you are and how you live, you don't even recognize the power and the privilege that you have. That is until in many communities where, let's say it's an integrated neighborhood, let's say a black family has 
the music up a little bit louder than what you would like as the neighbor. Then people use their privilege when they call 911. And sadly, when that dispatcher hears the voice of a white person on the other end, they are going to treat that call very differently. They're going to think about who's asking for help, who is a potential perpetrator. And when officers arrive on a scene, we see how those families are being treated. And most of the time, we ignore the racial implications of it. We think, well, it's because their music was too loud. Well, maybe your music wasn't loud enough. <laughs> I mean, I'm generalizing here, but I'm a person who likes some bass in my car. So you might, you know, even though I've been a law professor for 14 years, I might be driving down the street and you hear boom, 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 boom. You know, it might surprise you, but I like bass. I don't know if it's my African ancestors. I have no idea. All I know is that that is natural for me to have rhythm and bass. But many of my white friends listen to talk radio and they don't even listen to music unless it's, you know, classical or, or something else. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> you know, that's just a difference in, in style and taste that we have to accommodate for within society. But society tells us if we don't do it this way and you're a person of color, then it's the wrong way. It's the wrong way. And when we do accept people of color into our circles, a lot of times it's people who we're comfortable with. And much of the time it's because they've been assimilated into white culture. And I'm saying this as someone who, as I mentioned, started out in Mississippi, moved to South Central LA when I was eight, witnessed all the injustices. By the time I was nine, I decided that I wanted to become a lawyer to affect change. I didn't know any lawyers. I had only seen them on television advocating for people. And I said, maybe if I can do that, then I can begin to change things. And so that was the path that I, that I was on. Now, one of the things that changed my life in the trajectory of my life is the fact that when I was 14 years old, I received a scholarship to attend a boarding school in North Andover, Massachusetts, a very wealthy white institution. And in that environment, so I went from an environment of extreme poverty in South Central LA to one of extreme wealth. And when I looked around and saw that most of my friends had bedrooms that were bigger than the apartment that we lived in back in Los Angeles, I began to question history, what I had been taught, my own sense of identity. And I started reading books to gain an understanding and the more books I read, the more I began to understand that we have been taught many lies while in school, particularly about people of color and their contributions to American history. We had learned a lot about Europeans. I mean, a lot of times very useless information. <laughs> I mean, no offense, I'm just keeping it real. But we didn't learn much about ourselves. We didn't see ourselves reflected in a positive way in our history books. So I began to dig and dig and dig. And the more that I, I got into the books and developed a framework for processing my own experience, the bolder that I became in that environment. So that my level of consciousness increased. So when I would deal with racial microaggressions, or see my classmates dealing with those mi uh, racial microaggressions, I began to stand up and speak up. And I didn't care if I would be excluded from certain social groups as a result of my outspokenness. I care more about preserving my own sense of dignity and fighting for the underdog. So it was in that environment where I really began to develop a strong voice for civil rights. Now, it was also in that environment where I learned about generational poverty being passed down and the implications of generational wealth being passed down. In fact, um, in one of my history classes, when we started studying the institution of slavery, one of my classmates actually, who was from Louisiana, had a relative bring in the guns that her family used on the slave plantation that they owned as well as books that listed the names of slaves that they owned. 
Now, this family was extremely wealthy. They had never had to pay one person a single cent for enslaving human beings. That's how they built their wealth. And this young woman, again, she was wealthy. She was able to attend an elite institution. Able to attend elite institutions since the time she could walk and talk. Able to travel the world, had access to every opportunity on the backs of our ancestors and was never held accountable for those privileges. And I wouldn't have wanted my classmates to feel guilty. It's not about guilt. It's about truth and justice and an acknowledgement that what my family did was wrong. And we have benefited off of the backs of the people that we enslaved. That's how I'm able to be in this school today. And when I get older and I get my inheritance, I'm going to do something with it that pays society back or pays the African-American community back a small token of what my family gained while they practiced slavery. But that didn't happen for that young woman. She was very proud of her privilege, very proud of her status, had no shame about the fact that her family owned slaves. She was very comfortable with that. Didn't feel any need to apologize for it. She just said, as a matter of fact, this is just the way that it was. And so that showed me how many times when we have access to privilege, we can be unapologetic about the privilege that we have access to. We know on some level that it's there. We know that we may be treated a little bit differently when we walk into department stores. We're not followed around typically as a white person compared to as African Americans when we're followed around, where we're being made to feel like a criminal. Where me as a mother of black sons, I have to tell my boys stay close to me when we walk into a store because I don't want them wandering off, being a kid, picking things up, and having a store clerk or a security guard assume that they're trying to steal something. And then having to go through the humiliation and the pain of potentially being detained and or arrested. And as a mother, it really saddens me to be placed in a position where I literally, because of the ugliness of racial hatred, I have to strip my children of their innocence. I see innocence as a gift. And for many black children, that gift is taken away if they ever even had it at a very early age because of the ongoing and persistent inequities that exist in our society. And I've seen this up close and personal in my involvement in this movement. So I'll tell you a little bit about how I became involved. So I mentioned going off the boarding school learning everything that I learned and being empowered to speak truth to power and making a decision early on that I was real, willing to sacrifice social um, inclusion for the sake of standing up for justice, which I still think is a question that we need to ask ourselves. If we want to take bold action, what risks are we willing to take to get it? Because taking bold action requires bold faith. Are we willing to exercise our faith? Are we willing to potentially give up something? And I would argue that if we make the decision to give up something, God will multiply whatever we place in God's hands exponentially. That's what we have to begin to understand. We can't outgive God. We can't. So often we try to hang on to what we think is important, and God is saying, give that over to me. That has become an idol in your life. You care more about this thing than pleasing me. You care more about that thing than doing my will. You care more about that person's opinion than doing what I asked you to do. And we lose out when we refuse to open our hands and give God what God is asking for. And it's, very, it's a simple choice. It's a simple choice. And if we have difficulty making that choice, God is such an awesome God that you can ask for help in prayer to be able to release that thing. I'm not just talking this, I live this on a regular basis because I made a conscious decision to go on a journey with God. And so, so while the one thing I wanna share, while I was in boarding school, 
I actually learned about the lack of value that we place on black lives in our society through a personal experience. So during my freshman year, um, my mother called me in March um, of 1991, I believe. And she said, uh, Nakima, did you hear that Latasha got killed? And I said, Latasha got killed? Latasha was one of my junior high classmates who um, was 15 years old, African-American girl. While I was off at boarding school, she, she was stuck in the inner city of Los Angeles. And one day, Latasha walked into a local store not far from my house and she proceeded to walk to the back of the store. She grabbed a bottle of orange juice from the counter. She put the orange juice in her backpack and she took out her money and she started walking to the counter to pay. Well, the store owner assumed that Latasha was trying to steal the orange juice and she confronted Latasha. Latasha was so offended that she and the lady got into a physical altercation, like they traded blows. And mind you, again, Latasha was a 15-year-old girl at the time. And after their physical altercation, which just, it just doesn't make any sense in my mind, Latasha threw down the money, threw down the orange juice, and turned to walk out of the store. Well, the woman leaned over the counter and shot Latasha in the back of the head. And she fell like a sack of potatoes. You can Google her story. Um, for those who may be hip and have heard of the rapper Tupac, he actually dedicated a number of songs to Latasha and her memory. When I heard about the murder of Latasha, I was sad, I was outraged. I thought about the fact that that could have been me. One of the most tragic aspects of the situation was that not only was Latasha's life taken, over what seems like a bottle of orange juice, but was really a part of our unreconciled racial history in this country. And the person who killed her received 400 hours of community service, five years of probation, no jail time, and she had to pay for Latasha's funeral. Around the same time, a man kicked a dog and got 28 days in jail. So I learned as a kid, in my mind, that a black life was worth less than the life of an animal. How often do you see the white majority get outraged when animals are being abused? I mean, literally. Calling on the governor, the pre President Obama, they kicked the dog, this happened. And I, I don't agree with cruelty to animals. But how many of us actually take action when we see an innocent human life being taken? How many of us pick up the phone and call somebody and express outrage, especially if that person is from a different racial or ethnic group, if they speak a different language, if they were homeless, if they had a disability? How many of us stop and care enough and are outraged enough to actually do something about the injustice that occurred? And I would argue not enough of us are outraged when that happens. So we can gasp at the fact that a man kicked a dog and got more jail time, but how many stories play out in our daily lives where we place a greater emphasis on the life of an animal versus the life of a black person who was killed, for example, at the hands of police or by a vigilante? That's a question that we honestly need to grapple with and we need to think about what role our faith plays in all of that. If we're saying that we love God, if we're saying that as human beings we're made in God's image, then how is that reflected in the choices that we make about the lives that we value? So I learned that lesson too early in life at 14 years old. That seed was already planted in me and it impacted how I saw the world. And so I went on, you know, after um, I graduated from the school, I went to the University of Southern California where I actually majored in African American studies. And then I went on to law school. Within a year after graduating from law school, I was actually recruited to come and teach law. So I became a law professor, maybe about a month after my 26th birthday. 
A year after that, I was hired by the University of St. Thomas to teach law. Now, when I was hired at St. Thomas, I was initially hired to run a family law clinic, working with victims of domestic violence and child victims of domestic abuse. And we had a very successful clinic. But let me tell you, as I began to seek God and to attempt to go on a journey with God and to say, God, if you're real, show me. Just asking that simple question changed my life. God began to deal with me about starting a civil rights clinic. And this was back in 2005. And I didn't know anyone in civil rights in Minnesota. I had only moved here two years beforehand. And I had, I would say, drank the Kool-Aid, like most people, in terms of thinking about how great Minnesota is. Minnesota's a wonderful place to raise your kids, they said. You'll have a great quality of life. Our distressed communities aren't so distressed. What they didn't tell me is that that was typically for white Minnesotans. It took me two years to figure it out. Why? Because I had a level of privilege because of my educational background and the access to opportunity that I gained. But when I started putting down the Star Tribune and started picking up the local African-American papers, then I began to see the truth. I saw stories about educational disparities, racial disparities in criminal justice and policing, and I felt convicted that all of those things have been going on right under my nose, and, but because I lived in a suburb, because I was in the ivory tower of academia, because my kids were okay, that I didn't have to think about those things. But God began to deal with me about not only thinking about those things, but caring about those things and then doing something about those things. Those were the steps that I had to go through. So I had to make up my mind to take bold action. And, the first, and it wasn't easy. God kept bringing it again and again, start a civil rights clinic. And I had all types of excuses because I was afraid. But one of the things that I did, I said, God is not going to give me rest <laughs> until I take some steps in this direction. And so I picked up the phone and I called uh, the person at the time who was the president of the St. Paul NAACP. Now, I did not know this man, but I said, you know, I'm a professor and um, I'm curious to know about the issues that impact the African-American community. Will you meet with me? And he said, sure. So we sat down for four hours over coffee. And he began to tell me story after story after story about the injustices and the inequities that were happening in St. Paul, Minnesota and across the Twin Cities. And as I learned about those injustices, I said to him at the end of that meeting, I am going to start a civil rights legal clinic that begins to address these issues. And that's exactly what happened. I went to my superiors at St. Thomas. I said, I need to shut down this family law clinic and I need to start a civil rights clinic. I did not have a blueprint. And as I said, I didn't know anyone in civil rights. I just merely said yes to God and he brought the plan to me. As a matter of fact, even the name, the Community Justice Project, there were no Community Justice Project legal clinics around the country. No one had ever even talked about community justice. But after we formed our clinic within months, the dean of Georgetown Law School came to St. Thomas, learned about the Community Justice Project, and launched one there within the next year. And many other law schools around the country now have community justice clinics, community justice programs that was that was God. It was all God and just me simply obeying God and taking him at his word. See, he gave me a head start on tackling these racial justice issues, on tackling issues of policing, which was one of the main issues that I started to work on back in 2005 and 2006, long before we had the movement known as Black Lives Matter. I already had gained experience in challenging government, challenging laws, and challenging policies to address the inequities that flowed out of policing. The reality is that as our program became successful, I became complacent. I knew how to do the work. I knew how to walk into a meeting with government. I knew how to do the things that um, were necessary for my work, and I was comfortable. But let me tell you that God shook me out of my complacency in November of 2014 when I got the call 
to travel to Ferguson, Missouri. Now, it wasn't somebody picking up the phone saying, hey, Nikema, we need you in Ferguson. No, that did not happen. I'm talking about a call from God. Now, I was just like everybody else in August of 2014 when Mike Brown was killed, where many of us watched what happened in horror. We watched the events unfold um, with a lot of the protesting, the demonstrating. We didn't know what to make of it. it. It took many of us by storm and by surprise to see those events happening in that small town. And as a legal scholar, I would watch what was happening. I would blog, I would write articles, and I thought that was the extent of my involvement in the movement. But my life changed the, the day that the grand jury made the decision to not indict the officer who killed Mike Brown. Now, one of the things that really disturbed me was the fact that the powers that be in Missouri made the decision to make the announcement late at night. They already knew what the outcome was going to be. So why put the people in danger? You have a police force that's heavily armed. They have equipment, tasers, high-powered weaponry, surveillance equipment. You have the National Guard that's there that's also fully armed against the people, typically nonviolent, peaceful protesters. When I saw that, I said, this is deliberate on the part of the government because they know that the people are going to be angry. They're going to be outraged. And don't get me wrong, there's a place for anger and outrage in circumstances like what happened to Mike Brown. We can't all be comfortable and smiling and just saying, oh, or just, oh, that was such a tragedy and not get mad that it happened. So I understood the anger and the outrage and I shared some of it. And so I remember sitting there watching um, thing, videos on social media, seeing children get tear gas who were in safe houses with their parents, coffee shops, seeing officers throw tear gas into those buildings, and seeing children have milk and magnesia running down their faces while they're crying from being tear gas. And it just, it shook something in me. And this was the week of Thanksgiving. And I said to my family, I feel called to travel to Ferguson. I was shocked because I was comfortable here in Minnesota thinking that that was somebody else's movement and somebody else's responsibility. And I began to ask my children to pray. I said, I need prayer on this decision because I don't know what I'm walking into. And my son, who was nine at the time, came to me and he said, Mom, God said this is part of your journey. And that played a huge role in my decision to travel to Ferguson the next day. All I had was a phone number and an address of the National Lawyers Guild, the local chapter there. And so I, I showed up at the office, I got trained on being a legal observer, and I was warned that we could be tear gassed, but I didn't think that it would happen. We had these lime green hats that said legal observer that differentiated us from everyone else, so I thought we were safe. But our first night in Ferguson, we were tear gassed. And if you've never been tear gassed, I don't recommend just doing it for fun to see if you would enjoy the experience. I can guarantee you that you won't. When you are tear gassed, you cannot see, you cannot breathe. You're a little disoriented. You have fluids running all down your face. As a matter of fact, it was so dark, I had to pick up leaves off the ground and try to dry my face off. I could not see. And that happened for about 15 minutes. And I remember as I'm trying to catch my breath and, you know, um, snap back to reality, I remember saying, I'm not about this life. I thought I was an activist before I went to Ferguson, but then I realized I was actually just an armchair activist. And so through that experience, one of the things that really had an impact on me was that while I'm trying to recover from the tear gas, I looked around me and I saw young people who had also been tear gassed. But instead of feeling sorry for themselves as a result of that experience, after that tear gas wore off, they got right back on the front lines, protesting, marching, chanting, demonstrating, having standoffs with the police. And I watched them be resilient in the face of adversity and oppression and abuse. And their resilience taught me a lesson. I said, if they can do it, then I can do it. 
And so after spending that week of Thanksgiving in Ferguson, the moment that I got back to Minneapolis, I was approached by young people saying that they wanted to start Black Lives Matter Minneapolis, would I help them? And I'm thinking, I'm a law professor, like how can I help them? Little did I know I would be propelled to the front lines of that particular movement. And Liz gave a couple of examples. Um, you know, I, I was arrested on I-94 um, after Jamar Clark was killed on November 15th of 2015. We shut down I-94 um, the next day. And I had never been arrested prior to that, but one of the things that ran through my mind as we had the choice of whether we w would, were willing to be arrested was, you know what, Jamar Clark could have been my son. This is something I will get arrested for. And so along with dozens of people, I took the arrest. And it's because God said, take the arrest. So I obeyed, I threw fear out the window and said, take me. Matter, as a matter of fact, there's a picture of me just simply obeying God, stepping out um, in front of the protesters, kneeling down on the ground with my hands up, being the first one willing to be arrested. Now, if you had told me before going to Ferguson that I would do something like that, I would have thought you had lost your mind. But that's exactly what happened. A boldness overcame me. A desire to obey God overcame me. A desire to stand up and fight for what was right overcame me. And I felt like Queen Esther in that moment. If I perish, I perish. And it was such a powerful feeling to no longer have the fear of what the world may think, of the things that I would lose, of the consequences hanging over my head. I did not care at that point. I just simply wanted to obey God. And now the interesting thing about that experience is the fact that I was arrested just a week after my charges were dismissed in the Mall of America case. It was literally a week. I know the dean of my law school was like, wait, what? Because we, we had shut down the Mall of America, um, 3,000 of us, in December of 2014. So really, literally, a few weeks after I got back from Ferguson. As a matter of fact, a few days after I got back from Ferguson, we shut down the I-35 freeway. That was my first time doing something like that. We held a die-in on the freeway, marched to City Hall, demanded changes to policies, and then a few weeks later, we shut down the Mall of America. Now, at the time, I didn't consider myself to be an organizer. I considered myself to be maybe an activist, but a few days before the demonstration happened, young people approached me and they said, will you be a spokesperson on our behalf? And I said, yes. I did not know that that was going to bring me to the attention of law enforcement and prosecutors. And so a few weeks later, they put out a list of 11 people that they were charging as organizers. And guess what? My name was on that list. But guess what? I didn't panic. Why? Because as I knew they were going to charge people, first of all, I didn't think my name would be on the list because of the minor role that I played. And simply being a spokesperson in the media and attending meetings. But I said to God, only allow me to be charged if it's in your will. And so when my name was listed amongst the 11, I said, oh, God has a plan. God has a plan. And then I said, wait a minute, they're going to they're gonna charge me as an organizer? Then I'm going to become one. And I promise you, that's, that's what happened. I became weaponized. I mean, honestly, I mean, in the Holy Spirit, of course. <laughs> Where the fear left me, I mean, I just began to be more and more bold through that process. Um, as a result of, of being charged and having to step out more on the front lines and having a higher platform, it led me to continue to um, engage the community, take on systems of government, et cetera. And, um, after almost a year-long battle of fighting, I had, actually, I was charged with eight misdemeanors. I was one of two people with the most charges. So we fought all, I was um, co-counsel in my own defense, and I was a defendant. So I was the only person in that situation.
After fighting those charges for nearly a year, our charges were dismissed in early November, and then November 15th, we got the call that Jamar Clark had been shot in the head. And I knew once my charges had been dismissed that God didn't want me worrying about those charges anymore because God had a new assignment for me. <laughs> like literally, he, God moved one thing out the way so that I could step forward in the new thing. And so that's, that's what happened in my situation. And we occupied the fourth precinct. It was really organic. It's just people making a decision that enough was enough that this man had died unjustly at the hands of law enforcement, and we weren't just going to sit back and be spectators, but we were going to get involved in affecting change, and that led to an 18-day occupation outside of the 4th Precinct police station. And during that 4th Precinct occupation, many of us experienced Dr. King's vision of the beloved community. Why? Because we had people of all different racial and ethnic backgrounds, different religious backgrounds, different socioeconomic levels. We had homeless folks there, people with disabilities, people who were able-bodied. We had the LGBT community all together in one environment, standing in solidarity. We never ran out of food, even though we never had to ask for food. People brought hot meals, beverages, firewood, heating lamps. I mean, the list goes on and on. It was amazing. As a matter of fact, we had so much food that one of the local organizations that serves homeless people came on site and said, can we take this extra food to feed the people? We said, please take it. I mean, I, I learned about the abundance of God through that experience if I didn't know it before. And so after those 18 days, we, we were out there in the freezing cold. Let's face it, Minnesota is cold, <laughs> freezing cold. We, we dealt with blizzards and snowstorms and <clears throat> rain and police tear gassing us and shooting us with rubber bullets and pulling guns on us for 18 days. And we made many demands during that 18 day process, but more importantly, we built strength and solidarity and we learned the importance of taking bold action. And through that experience, We've continued to rise up. As we saw last night, several of us camping out in front of the governor's mansion, demanding that he make a statement about the shooting death of Philando Castile at the hands of the St. Anthony Police Department. And after blocking traffic, we sat there, we were peaceful, we sang songs, we chanted. The governor actually came out of his mansion at 10 a.m and addressed us as part of a press conference that we held. Now, there have been many demonstrations in front of the governor's mansion, but this is the first time I've actually seen him come out in response to public pressure to address a concern of the protesters. So we felt that that was a victory. And if it hadn't been for obeying God, challenging myself, going off to Ferguson, being willing to show up outside of the place where Jamar Clark was killed, showing up last night, the place where Philando um, Castile was killed, I might have missed out on an opportunity to see God be God. Before I left to travel, to this area for um, our conference tonight, there were hundreds of people of different racial and ethnic backgrounds, some of whom took off work, some of whom couldn't sleep, some of whom just came to bring food, some of whom were curious, who showed up saying that a life was taken and I'm going to take a stand. And I'm very thankful for that. That joy filled my heart. And despite only having 30 minutes of sleep, it gave me the joy and the favor and the power to come up here running on fumes and deliver this message to all of you. I thank you all for allowing me to be here. I pray that you obey the, the call of God like never before. Take bold action and challenge yourselves
to walk in the power, the authority, and the beauty of the Almighty God. Thank you. God is so good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I just, I feel the love. I'm, I'm so blessed to be here with you all. The energy that I feel will continue to propel me forward in the fight for justice. I thank you. So Nakima, or rather Dr. Levy Pounds, it's yeah, hard to... Nakima. <laughs> Nakima is willing to take just a few questions. And uh, we have microphone runners, and I am not calling on people. I think it's up to the microphone people to move themselves to the people with raised hands. And I would like, to, I'm just gonna take this prerogative. I would like to give opportunity, especially to friends of color first. If there are friends of color who would like to ask our speaker a question, please raise your hand and we'll take a couple of those first. Thanks for letting us know. Can you hear it? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you so much for bringing class in and bringing it all the way from the ancestors up here. Can you so, wave your hand so I can see you? Oh, on the, oh, hi. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for bringing class in and bringing it all the way up from the ancestors in Mississippi up this river. So we have some issues here, and you spoke about being bold. And being bold means having this in a place where people who come from LA, South Central, can get to. So if you wanna speak about class and how that impacts with faith, please do. So you want me to talk about my socioeconomic status? <laughs> Not really. I'd like you to talk about how we all need to face class and how we have that privilege to pay for plane fares, et cetera. Okay. So I would say that class is definitely a big part of the privilege that we all experience in our society. So as a person of color, even though I face some level of disadvantage, because again, there is a white supremacist ideology that we've all become accustomed to that affects everyone, regardless of how conscious you are because of the messages that we're sent, I still have some form of privilege because of my education and because of the access that I have to economic opportunity. Now what I typically have seen amongst people who are middle class and above is that we tend to ignore the fact that what we have is actually a privilege. We take it for granted. And I see it when I walk through downtown Minneapolis and on any given day, I see people having lunch on a patio or sitting in a nice restaurant, sipping wine and relaxing in the middle of the day. And it's simply par for the course. Or going out to dinner and looking around and seeing people eating expensive meals. It's very easy when you have access to those resources and you can go out a couple times a week to take that for granted and to recognize that it is actually a privilege. And I'm reminded of my own privilege when I go into some of our most impoverished communities. As a matter of fact, in September of last year, I actually moved to the North Minneapolis community. 
which is, for those who don't know, um, one of the uh, poorest communities in the Twin Cities, and um, it has a high percentage of people of color. And, it, and I moved there on purpose. I actually prayed and asked God where God wanted me to live, asked my children to pray. And by the end of the day, through a series of events, I was standing outside of a house in North Minneapolis that hadn't even been advertised, just through some phone calls, and God said, that's your house. Literally, by the next morning, the owner calls me. I mean, it's just, it's hard to explain, but that was the house that God chose for me, and it's right on the corner, catty corner to a park, catty corner to a mosque, and right in front of my house is a bus stop. So I see people who don't have access to regular transportation, who sit at the bus stop sometimes in the sweltering heat, sometimes in freezing cold temperatures. And I think about the privilege that I have simply by owning a vehicle. And the fact that it's something that many people, although they may want access to it, they don't have access to it. So I would, I, I would say, it's important for us to not take for granted the blessings that we've been given. It's also important for us to not fall back into this sense of guilt because of what we've been given. But I think the problem comes in when we think that we're entitled to what we've been blessed with. That sense of entitlement is real. And sometimes it becomes like an idol in our hearts that prevents us from sharing with other people. That prevents us from opening doors to opportunity for other people. That prevents us from opening our eyes to the plight of the poor. So we do have to challenge those economic privileges and understand that access to that type of opportunity continues to propel us forward. We learn things that we can pass on from one generation to the next, and that's how we're able to perpetuate the resources that we have. And when you're poor, it's just the opposite. If you haven't learned um, the ways of society, especially economically, you're destined to remain at the bottom, typically no matter how hard you work. And we can't take that for granted that there are people working hard every day, working their fingers to the bone for very little pay. One way that we can use our privilege to advocate for people like that is to fight for a higher minimum wage. As a matter of fact, during the Civil Rights Movement, um, Dr. King actually tried to launch a poor people's campaign. And he said in November um, of 1967, we're going to launch this Poor People's Campaign in April of 1968. We're going to travel to Washington, D.C. We're going to demand universal health care. We're going to demand a guaranteed income for all Americans, a minimum income, and a higher minimum wage and affordable housing. And he said, we are not going to leave Washington, D.C. until we get what we came for. Well, guess what? Dr. King was assassinated in April of 1968. And I do not believe that that was a coincidence. Because when he started talking about matters of economic justice, that's when he really became dangerous because his um, activism, his style of protest could have meant toppling the system of capitalism on its head. So we have a lot of unfinished business and advocating around matters of economic justice so that wealth is more equitably distributed in our society. Thank you so much for coming, especially in view of what's just happened and what you've had to face in making this long journey here. So thank you very much. I'd like you to say some words, if you could, about the damage of internal oppression in which people of color, in which black people, I can only speak for myself and my community, harm each other, harm ourselves and harm each other with annihilation and 
predation within our own community that sets us up to be harmed by all of the institutions you talked about, especially the criminal justice. And I say this as the aunt of a nephew who has been serially incarcerated, who goes into the system and comes out as if in a trance and commits again and again. At some point in the past, the black church was very instrumental in propelling a movement forward. It was not only for civil rights, but for also mental emancipation for black people. But that does not play such a role in the lives of many young people. And I would just like to know what you have to say, because we have a part to play too. While we're looking at institutional racism and white people are getting themselves together and getting right with it, people of color have to go that extra mile too. And I'm just wondering how, what you have found that is useful to get at this internalized racism that even some of us black people don't know are operating within us and harming us further. Thank you very much. Well, the best way that I can answer that is to understand the history of the institutions that you're talking about. We can't separate what's happening I would say particularly in poor black communities because we say the black community, but what we're really talking about in terms of the issues that you reference are poor blacks. That's a different category and it goes to the class issues that were referenced earlier. What we have to understand about what's happening with poor blacks is that it is a manifestation of institutional racism, slavery, and oppression. And I'll give you an example. If you look at the language of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which was supposed to abolish slavery, and it was um, enacted in 1865, the language says, I'm gonna paraphrase here, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall be allowed except if one has been duly convicted of a crime. Now, when I was in law school, we glossed right over that caveat and we just celebrated the fact that slavery ended. It wasn't until I became a legal scholar focused on the criminal justice system and the war on drugs that I began to deconstruct the language of the 13th Amendment. And some scholars suggest that that language was a compromise between Northerners and Southerners, that you had some Southerners who were angry about slavery ending and who actively said, we're gonna get our labor one way or another. And think about when you pull men from the workforce, I'm saying men in particular, that's no longer competition within the workforce. And so what happened in many southern states is that the prisons and jails were filled with poor white men because there is a thread running through the, the white community, particularly poor white people, who have a lot of similarities to poor black people. We just don't talk a lot about them. As a matter of fact, when we're talking about poor whites, what do we typically call them? trash we call them trash and we never question the fact that we are demeaning human beings simply because they are of a different socioeconomic status they may do things differently but we call them trash meaning we want to throw them away i think that that's sad and it's it, i would say diabolical on some level but we're all guilty of it so no judgment no judgment but the the reality is um the prisons and jails were filled with poor white men after the enactment of the 13th Amendment, many Southern states changed their laws on the books and they made standard behavior by black men a crime. And this is documented in the book, Slavery by Another Name, which is on your reading list. So if a black man was hanging out late at night, talking too loud, spitting on the sidewalk, unemployed, those things were considered crimes. They would be brought into the criminal justice system tried by an all-white jury, nine times out of ten found guilty, and forced to perform back-breaking labor in unsanitary conditions for no pay. And guess who profited off of that inmate labor? The state. Railroad companies, corporations, mining companies paid the state for this free labor by inmates. And think about that system. So you have newly freed black men in particular 
brought into captivity under the guise of another system, simply for being themselves, even though they still were deprived of access to economic opportunity. And so those things have generational impacts. But the question is, how do we break the cycle? Part of how we break the cycle is by creating access to economic opportunity. I mean, it's, it's just that simple. <clears throat> But how often do we focus on jobs for poor blacks or poor whites? A lot of times we demonize them and we set up institutions and structures that entrap them and exploit what some consider to be their weaknesses or shortcomings. We've seen um, beyond what happened in the aftermath um, of the enactment of the 13th Amendment, a resurgence of the criminal justice being used to entrap and enslave the poorest and most vulnerable people in our society many of them poor people of color, many of them with mental health issues, over 50% of those who are incarcerated have mental health issues. And that does not even include those who suffer from chemical um, dependency issues. And so a lot of the folks that we're talking about aren't able to do things the way that we expect them to do them because some of them are grappling with mental health issues. Some haven't had access to treatment, some aren't on medication, but they're dealing with those things. We started shutting down our mental health institutions and then prisons became the de facto place for people with mental health issues and that all happened on our watch. Beyond that, we had the start of the war on drugs which was declared by President Nixon in the 1970s. It was exacerbated by President Reagan in the early 1980s where they made low level nonviolent offenses similar to major crimes. So for example, uh, one of the ways that they did this is through this notion of um, drug conspiracies. So they use mandatory minimums and sentencing guidelines. So a mandatory minimum, for example, is let's say that um, someone is caught with a firearm. Under the previous system, you would actually determine that person's criminal history, um, whether or not they had a chance for rehabilitation, was it a situational issue, and maybe they would just get probation based on their individual characteristics. Well, under the new sentencing regime, you're caught with a firearm, that could be a five-year mandatory minimum prison term in federal prison, hands down. And then you're caught with the firearm and drugs, maybe that's 10 years without regard for whether you should go to prison in the first place or you should be rehabilitated. So in 1980, we had 500,000 people incarcerated. By 1990, that number doubled to a million. By 2000, that number doubled to two million. And now we have more than 2.3 million people currently incarcerated. And another 7.3 million under some form of correctional supervision or control. And that is not just about people who make mistakes we all have made mistakes, okay? But God's grace have, has covered us. And the reality is this, most of us will never see the inside of a prison even when we have committed crimes because of our privilege. So we have to not only extend grace when people are in that circumstance and try to give them access to opportunity like we've seen in Los Angeles with the founder of Homeboy Industries, Father Greg Boyle, who says nothing stops a bullet like a job and jobs, not jails. And what he set out to do was to create jobs for people who were cycling in and out of the criminal justice system, who were in gangs, who faced criminal um, punishments for their behavior, who faced chemical abuse issues. He created an atmosphere where they could thrive, where they could thrive. And it's actually the most successful and largest employer of former gang members and people with criminal histories in the country. He showed that it is possible to create that type of infrastructure, but how many other parts of our society does that exist? I've traveled to many parts of the country. Very few have programs like Homeboy Industries to catch those who fall, to catch those on the margins. And as a Christian, to catch those who Jesus would have reached, who were on the margins. Those who were shunned by the rest of society, that's who he went out and touched and ministered to. But in our society, we're taught to be judgmental of them. We're taught to ignore our own privilege, access to benefits, sense of entitlement, and then to cast judgment upon them.
when in reality these systems are being constructed right before our very eyes. The literature is there, the statistics are there, the anecdotes are there, so what are we doing about it? So that's the best answer that I can give about that situation. And in terms of community violence, what we often hear when we declare Black Lives Matter, for example, and we fight against state-sanctioned state violence, people say, well, what about black-on-black -black crime? My response to that is, first of all, when white people commit crime, it's just called crime. <laughs> it is. They can shoot up movie theaters, I mean, do all types of stuff, bomb stuff, it's crime even though the majority of folks killed are white people. So why are we racializing crime in that way? So I, I see black on black crime as a misnomer because what it reflects is this pathology in the black community, which I would argue is a lie. There is no pathology in the black community. We're talking about the environments that we have created that make it more likely that someone will be on a pathway to prison rather than a pathway to college. That is by design, often based on your zip code, often based on generational poverty being transferred, often based on inadequate educational opportunity, and based on having low-wage jobs where you're working to survive and you still can't get ahead. So we have to deconstruct systems and challenge those laws and policies if we're going to get to the root and not just blame the individual who falls prey to a system that's been constructed for his or her demise. Yeah, okay. So I'm being told that um, our time is actually up, but we do have another session where I'm going to be there with whomever shows up and I'm really looking forward to it. I want to thank you all for your love, your support, your time, your attention, your questions and all of that. God bless you. And thank you again. I love you guys.